money. Order. If that Senator really Polly, is the case, it's been 2 p.m. We will move to questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham, and I refer to page 37 of Budget Paper Number One. Can the minister confirm that, despite spending almost $100 billion and racking up a record $100 trillion in debt, the wage price index and consumer price index forecast on that page show a cut to real wages? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank, uh, thank Senator Wong for her question. And indeed, this is a budget where it's been clear for some time in relation to the information provided by the Reserve Bank, Treasury, their analysis about what it would take to see pressure in relation to real wages growth. They've updated. They've updated. They've updated. Well, a, a Labor government would give you many things, but it certainly wouldn't give you certainly wouldn't give you more jobs. Certainly wouldn't give you more jobs across Australia. Order. Certainly wouldn't give you a stronger economy. Order. Certainly, certainly would give you, Order. though, probably Senator, higher taxes. Sorry, Order. I was just responding to the interjection, Order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong on a point of just order. Responding. Point I, of order. I, I must point take Senator order. Wong on the point of order. Senator, Ber Senator Wong. Point of order, direct relevance. I asked a very specific question about a table in the budget papers, which, which demonstrates that despite racking up a trillion dollars in debt, real wages go backwards. And I've asked the minister to confirm that. Um, interjections are always disorderly. It helps if ministers are not interjected upon so that they are not tempted to respond to them. Have you reminded the minister of the question? I urge senators to remain silent and allow the minister to answer it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, before, uh, before I was interrupted by those opposite, I was pointing out, Mr. President, that the Reserve Bank and the Treasury had indeed provided updated information in relation to the Nauru, the effective Order. rate of full employment at which you expect to see wages pressure increase in the economy. And their updates that they had released and provided indicated that it was necessary to get unemployment sustainably below 5 per cent, indeed closer to 4.5 per cent, to see that type of pressure build, particularly in what is a low interest rate and low inflation environment. Uh, that we face at present. And so, Mr. President, what this government has outlined in our economic plan, in our budget, is a very clear plan to deliver stronger employment growth that achieves lower unemployment outcomes, that meets those types of provisions and expectations that the Reserve Bank and the Treasury have outlined to drive unemployment below 5 per cent and to achieve that in sustainable terms. That's something that hasn't been achieved in this country for a very long time, Mr. President, but we are well placed order. to achieve Senator that. Now. Birmingham. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, the cut to real wages in the budget, that's what the question was yeah, about. Um, about Sen Senator Wong, I've allowed you to restate part of the question. I'm reluctant to get so I I'm reluctant to get so specific in determining direct relevance that a minister, when asked a question of this nature, cannot be talking about employment and its impact upon the economy. I, I think the minister, with respect, is being directly relevant. I can't instruct him how to in answer a question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. So, as I was outlining, and we're following not, not the views of the Labor Party there, but indeed the advice of the advice of economic experts at the Reserve Bank and the Treasury about how best to achieve the jobs growth Order. that will then lead to the unemployment outcomes Order. that Senator can drive Birmingham. the wages growth. The answer has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. How much longer will Australians have, have to wait to see an increase in their real wages? Senator Birmingham. No, Mr. President, Mr. President, we have been seeing real wages growth. Let's not accept the premise of that question that somehow wages have not been growing. They've been growing. They've been growing, of course, in a record low inflation environment, a record low Order. interest rate environment. Order. We also have seen Australians, though, live through a global pandemic. Australians Order. living through the biggest disruption Order to the global economy left. since World War II. But fortunately for Australians, unlike those across much of the rest of the world, they've enjoyed policy settings and success right across this country that's kept their jobs safe, that's kept their jobs safe and secure, that has actually achieved an outcome of seeing more Australians in work today than was the case when we went into the pandemic. Twelve months ago, nobody would have thought that was an achievable outcome to have more Australians in work today than at the time the nation was slipping into recession. But there is absolutely still more to be done. 
and that's what our budget plans Order, outline. Senator Birmingham, to keep growing jobs, has which expired. we can help to achieve. Order, Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. How is it that you, as finance minister, and this prime minister have delivered a trillion dollars in debt, but a budget which ensures that real wages go backwards? Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President, we are absolutely proud as a government to have delivered successive budgets that have kept Australians safe and secure. Our budgets, our plans, our policies have saved the jobs of Australians, have saved businesses across Australia, have created an environment for which Australians enjoy far greater economic security than nearly anywhere else around the world. I know those opposite want to pretend that we live in some sort of alternate reality world, but you need only go and look. Go and look at the European Union and see a double-dip recession occurring in that part of the world. Go and look elsewhere around the world and try to find another country, another developed economy, where jobs have recovered to the extent at which they have in Australia. Go and find another country where businesses have survived at the rate they have in Australia. We have much to be proud of in this country. Our government won't let those opposite talk it down. We are determined to keep backing Australian businesses to drive the jobs growth Order, for Senator all Australians. Birmingham. Senator Chandler. Order. Senator Chandler is on her feet. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government's 2021-2022 budget sets out a comprehensive plan to secure Australia's economic recovery and build for the future? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, last night we did deliver a budget that sets out the next stages in Australia's recovery plan. The next stage is in our plan to make sure we keep Australians safe safe from the threats of COVID-19 to their health, safe from the threats of COVID-19 to their jobs and their economic security. Equally, a plan that lays out how we will continue to grow the economy over the long term and drive further economic growth, productivity growth and jobs creation for Australians, and of course, how we will deliver on our promises to fund the essential services that Australians rely on. Even in the face of an economy of a pandemic, Mr. President, that has knocked our economy and parts of the world for six, we're seeing remarkable resilience across Australia. We're seeing consumer sentiment at its highest in 11 years, business conditions reaching record highs. All of that after the first recession that Australia had faced in 30 years caused by the COVID pandemic. Most countries, Mr. President, are simply still struggling to get back to the starting points they had at the pandemic. But we have managed to get Australia back to the point of having more people in work than had been the case. And that gives us the opportunity to deliver on our commitments to invest in, in essential services. $18 billion for aged care services, more than $2 billion for mental health services and over $13 billion honouring our promises to fully fund the National Disability Insurance Scheme. This budget delivers key measures that will turbocharge the economy further, continue to drive economic growth, investment and create jobs into the future, including extra tax relief for low and middle income earners as part of, of course, our sweeping tax reforms delivering lower income tax across the board, extension of the temporary full expensing measures to make sure we get business investment going, new apprenticeship places, 100,000 of them being supported by additional government support programs and $110 billion Order, of infrastructure to build Senator the country Chandler, stronger. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline some of the major job-creating measures in the 2021-2022 budget? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, our measures will help to create some 250,000 further jobs over the next two years. Having taken, taken employment in Australia to a record level now, we're going to see under this budget settings a further 250,000 additional jobs created. Since the last budget, almost half a million have already been created, and this will see 750,000 jobs growth across Australia. We're investing, Mr. President, a record $6.4 billion this year in skills and training support to make sure that Australians get the skills they need to secure the jobs of the future doubling our commitment to the Job Trainer Fund, supporting more than 450,000 new training places to upskill job seekers and young people, and importantly, an additional $2.7 billion to extend the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements Program, 
Boosting apprenticeships will support more than 170,000 new apprenticeships Order. and traineeships Birmingham, across Australia. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Order. <laughs> Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Can Order. the minister outline how tax relief and other measures will support families and businesses and drive investment in our economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, the Liberal and National Parties will always be the parties of lower taxes. Lower taxes that we are delivering. Order. Lower taxes that we are delivering Order through our income tax cuts. Lower taxes Order. that we are delivering through an extension of the low and middle income tax offset for another year, supporting 720,000 hard-working individuals across my own state of South Australia and many more, 10 million across Australia altogether. We're the party that's making sure we back Australian business to bring forward their investment decisions through, through the full uh, expensing measures and the temporary loss carryback measures that are in place. And by bringing forward those expenses and those investment decisions, Australian businesses will be creating more jobs. Australian businesses will be investing in their productivity and their competitiveness, which will make sure, and it's been working, Senator Ayres. I'm happy to say Australian businesses have been doing that, which is why Order. we've extended this program. We've extended it because Order, it's helping to deliver the jobs for, the for Australians. Has expired. Order. Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister confirm that last night's budget reveals that gross debt will reach $1.2 trillion in 2024-25, and can the minister confirm that he will be responsible for the highest level of debt in Australia's history? Wow. Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. So, uh, so, so thanks, Mr President. Indeed, the debt figures are published transparently in the budget papers. And the debt figures are there for all to see. Importantly, importantly, Mr. President, importantly, Mr. President, under this budget, net debt across each of the 10 years of the medium term comes in lower than had been forecast in last year's budget. Mr. President, what we're able to deliver across this budget is investment in essential services for Australians, whilst ensuring that we keep debt at levels below what had been forecast in last year's budget. That's a dividend from sound economic management. That's a dividend from being able to create more jobs across the Australian economy. That, Mr President, is a dividend from having created the environment through tax incentives, through incentives for Australian business, through incentives for Australian households Order, and Senator through sound Pratt. management that creates the right environment to be able to see, to be able to see recovery across our economy. I hear Senator Wong talking about the iron ore price. Well, of course, this budget, like all our preceding coalition budgets, takes a conservative approach in relation to things like assumptions around the iron ore price. Once again, if Senator Wong hadn't realised, we project in the budget iron ore prices declining to $55 per tonne. A conservative approach. A conservative approach to give confidence. Order. To give confidence to, to, give confidence Senator, to Senator the Wong. budget papers. Oh, and Senator Wong Order. wants to talk to me about debt now, Senator. Senator Wong wants to talk to me about debt. This is Senator Wong. I was here, I, 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 I'm not sure where Senator Wong was last March, when everybody over there was saying we should extend, extend the JobKeeper program or the sky was going to fall in. This lot were calling for more Order. spending just a few months ago. And when we showed, when we showed the judgment and the Order. strength to Senator phase Birmingham out of that program, we were proven right. Expired. Order. Yesterday we managed Order. Yesterday we managed to hear the other place. I'm hoping we don't return the favour. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I do have a supplementary. What is the dollar figure for peak gross debt, and in what year will it be reached? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, over the forward estimates, gross debt is expected to reach a within-year peak of $1.2 billion, or $50.920 billion, or 50.9%. Order. Uh, uh, Order. One, one thousand, yes, one point two two trillion dollars, or fifty point nine per cent of GDP Order. in April 2025. 
or gross debt, uh, as the budget papers make very clear, is expected to stabilise in the medium term at around 51 per cent of GDP, compared, Mr. President, compared, Mr. President order, to around Senator 55 Birmingham, I've got per cent Gallagher in last point of year's order. budget. Order. Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Senator Gallagher? Point of order on um, relevance, um, direct relevance. We didn't ask for the percentage. We asked for the dollar figure for peak gross debt. Um, I, I, know was... I know he's having trouble saying the word trillion, but I've asked what the peak I've, I've, what dollar figure is, I've not percentage. You, I've allowed you to restate the question, Senator Gallagher. I was listening carefully to the minister's answer, and despite the interjections, I think I heard about half of it. Um, I've allowed you to remind him of the question. He was, I, I, Senator Wong, before you get to your feet, I was struggling to hear the minister and all the answer. There was so much noise in the chamber. I've allowed Senator Gallagher to remind the minister of the question. Um, the minister, in my view, from what I heard, was answering it. I'm not going to instruct him how to answer a question, but I'm going to listen carefully to what he says, and I'll ask senators to remain silent so that I may rule if people raise subsequent points of order. In my view, from what I heard, he was being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, in the, in the first question I faced today, the opposition asked me the question premised on the basis of $1.7 trillion. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. It was a very simple question, point of order direct relevance, for peak gross debt in dollar terms. Um, I, the minister, I think, spoke for seven seconds then. I don't think. I, I cannot go. I cannot. If a minister, if a minister is talking, it was a, it was a factual question. It does not allow. We'll waste time. Order on my right. Order on my left. Order. Now, the first principle I have is that I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question. The second principle is this was a straight factual question, so it does not allow for commentary. And I do not believe the minister was providing any commentary. I believe he was addressing the issue of gross debt. I am reluctant to instruct a minister if they are being very specific to the question, in my view, to get to the point of how to answer a question. I cannot instruct the minister to provide a particular number, fact, statement or observation to the chamber. There is an opportunity to debate the merits of answers afterwards. I believe the minister was constraining himself to directly relevant issue raised by the question. I can't instruct him any further than that. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, as I was indicating before, the opposition, in their first question that they asked today, referenced $1.7 trillion in relation to gross debt figures. Now, Mr. President, what we see in relation to the medium-term projections is that gross debt Order. is predicted to stabilise at the lower— Time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. In the first question, we used the figure $1.2 trillion, so I'm not sure where $1.7 is, but this uh, supplementary um, is, uh, can the minister confirm if Senator Canavan is correct when he says, and I quote, we have a higher debt to GDP than we have ever had since the end of World War II? Is Senator Canavan correct? Senator Birmingham. Thanks. Um, th thanks, Mr. President. And indeed, indeed, Mr. President, we do face globally the biggest economic disruption since World War II. So it is not surprising, Mr. President, that in responding to the first global pandemic in a century, in responding to the biggest economic disruption to the world since World War II, in responding through programs like JobKeeper which those opposite argued should have been bigger and lasted for longer, yet now they come in here with great hypocrisy and seek to criticise, seek to criticise uh, the level of debt. It's not surprising that we, would face, that we would face those circumstances. I am addressing specifically Order. the question that was asked Order and the quote left. that was there. And Mr. President, Mr. Order. President, it is clear, it is clear that across the world there has been a significant increase in government debt. Australia has managed to deliver a budget now that sees a reduction in Order, what was projected Senator of Birmingham, government debt than was expected has expired. Year. Senator Hughes. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government's 21-22 budget is securing Australia's recovery by supporting women to further participate in the workforce? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank Senator Hughes for her question, her enduring commitment to women's economic security. Mr. President, the Morrison government is proud to be making a record investment of $1.9 billion towards the economic security of Australia's women in this year's budget. At this, part, this is part of a, a broader package, $3.4 billion package of targeted measures that will also improve women's safety uh, and their health and well-being. Our measures have been designed to give more women more choices and more chances to participate in the workforce and secure their economic security while they are working and also into retirement. We know that a comprehensive system of childcare is the key to helping women return to the workforce and participate in the workforce, which is one of the best ways to ensure that women are economically secure. When you remove barriers to women's workforce participations, all Australians reap the benefits. It's estimated that increasing women's workforce participation by just 5 per cent will increase Australia's real GDP by $20 billion over five years, and all Australians will benefit from a more prosperous Australia. And it's not just women with children that benefit. Around two-thirds of women with children in the workforce with children under two uh, use their grandparents for informal support, and around a third of women use grandparents as their only support. By making childcare more affordable and more accessible, we're actually freeing up older women to also return to the workforce to increase their lifetime earnings and to secure their economic future. So women's workforce participation hit a record high of 61.8 per cent as in March, but we know that it can go further. That's why we're investing an additional $1.7 billion in childcare, building on the $10.3 billion that we already provide every year. We're removing the childcare subsidies annual cap and with increased childcare subsidies available to families with two or more children, benefiting around 250,000 families. Order, Senator Hume. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. I do. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate how the government is supporting women in work, including Indigenous women? Before I call Senator Hume, again, I'm going to ask for silence during the question. I would prefer silence at all times, but particularly during the question, I will insist upon it. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government is acutely aware of, of the needs, the very unique weeds, needs of Indigenous women. That's why this women's budget statement provides $77.4 million dollars in dedicated funding to improve Indigenous women's economic security. We have committed $13.9 million over four years to establish an early stage social enterprise foundation. Now, this foundation will provide capacity building and financial support dedicated to social enterprises that are on the ground in Indigenous communities right now. We know that partnering with these organisations is one of the very best ways that we can improve the economic security of Indigenous women and support them into work opportunities because of the unique insights that grassroots organisations can provide. Order. Additional funding of $63.5 million over Senator four Thorpe. years will support additional places for Indigenous Girls Academies, which support young Indigenous women into their Order. studies, Senator increase Hume. their Time Year 12 the attainment and provide— Senator Thorpe, Senator Hughes. Can the minister advise how the government is supporting women's economic security for their retirement? We're wasting time. Order. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government knows that women's economic security in their retirement is particularly important. We're focused on improving the retirement outcomes for women by increasing superannuation coverage and making our system fairer. By removing the $450 per month threshold for superannuation eligibility imposed by the Labor Party when superannuation began in 1992, we are ensuring that women who are working part-time or in multiple jobs are accruing superannuation for their futures. We are also extending the access to the downsizer contribution and removing the work test to improve superannuation's flexibility. 
We know that more women than men make voluntary contributions to their superannuation accounts at all stages of their lives. And this is the key element to the retirement income system working better for women. This government's reforms remove barriers to superannuation system, facilitate those voluntary contributions so that all women can bolster their own super on Order, their own Senator terms Hume. when they're able Time to do the so. Answer has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Minister, the two great economic challenges of our times are the breakdown of our climate and growing wealth inequality. In your government's budget, these great challenges have been either left unaddressed or deliberately made worse. Knowing that climate change will make fires, droughts and floods more frequent and more intense, how can you possibly justify the tens of billions of dollars of public subsidies your government is handing over to billionaires and big fossil fuel corporations to continue polluting our atmosphere with carbon? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, I thank Senator McKim for his question. Um, like those opposite, he must have missed the pandemic that seems to have had a rather profound impact in relation to economic security right across the world. And so, Senator McKim, I would contest the fact that there isn't something else right here, right now, that is indeed creating challenges for economies, including Australia's around the world. And so this budget is framed very much first and foremost on the premise of continuing to keep Australians safe and secure in the management of the pandemic and, of course, in relation to their job security as well. But Mr. President, but Mr. President I would also suggest that Senator McKim may wish to look a little more thoroughly through the budget papers in terms of the measures that are there when he raises climate change Order. about ensuring we address emissions reduction. $1.2 billion in this year's budget uh, to establish Australia at the forefront of low emissions technology, innovation and commercialisation, particularly pursuing international partnerships, a high integrity carbon offset scheme in our Indo-Pacific region, support for four additional clean hydrogen export hubs, bringing our support there to a total of five. Support for Australia's hydrogen industry overall. Support for the development of carbon capture technologies and hubs. Support for the National Soil Carbon Innovation Challenge. Mr President, let me also address Senator McKim's question indeed about inequality. The greatest path, the greatest path to be able to achieve greater equality is by creating more jobs across our economy, by getting workforce participation to its highest possible levels and by achieving the maximum in terms of workplace participation. And that's what our government has proudly achieved, being able to drive pre-pandemic workforce participation to record highs and now seeing record numbers of Australians Order. in jobs, which is the Senator fastest McKean, way to address No mention of the $51 billion of public subsidies to fossil fuel in this budget. Minister, why are you continuing to hand out billions of dollars to the big corporations and billionaires to allow the continued destruction of our environment? Why does your government's budget continue to favour coal, gas and oil over renewable energy? And how can you possibly justify handing billionaire Andrew Forrest tens of millions of dollars of public subsidies for new gas projects during a climate emergency? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, it, it sounds to me, if I'm taking a wild guess at what Senator McKim is conflating into what he's calling as subsidies, it sounds to me like Senator McKim is wanting us to ensure that Australian farmers are paying higher taxes in relation to the fuels they use. Well, I can tell Senator McKim that's not something that a coalition government will do. A coalition government will not be jacking up the taxes that Australian farmers pay in relation to their fuels. We will not be rendering our resources industry less competitive around the rest of the world. These are important parts of our current economic architecture and our future economic architecture as well, providing jobs, providing more opportunities for Australians now and into the future, driving our export earnings potential. We're doing that in an environment where we are also investing in new technology opportunities. We have seen, Mr President, phenomenal growth in relation to the renewables energy sector, 
and you can see by our measures in this budget we're investing in the next Order. wave of Senator emissions Birmingham reducing time. technologies the too. Expired. Senator McKim, a final Thank you, President. Question. Still no mention of the $51 billion of fossil fuel subsidies in this budget. Minister, according to the budget projections, real wages will go backwards over the next two years, mm -hmm. with housing affordability once again getting worse. Why has your budget ignored social housing yet again? Why are you instead trying to trap single parents into subprime mortgages? Is this budget an admission that the government wants to keep wages low and drive house prices even higher? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, let me completely refute, completely refute the suggestion there by Senator McKim that somehow our government is trying to, quote, trap single parents into subprime mortgages. Mr President, what our government is proudly trying to do is to give single parents a greater opportunity of home ownership. Of home ownership. That is a proud Liberal value, Mr President. That is something that has stretched through the Liberal and National parties throughout the history of our parties to help encourage home ownership in Australia. And in this budget, Mr. President, we are proud to try to make it easier, make it easier for young Australians Order. to buy their own home, to make it easier for single parents to be able to buy their own home, to make more available more family homes by encouraging older Order. Australians to downsize at the right stage Senator in their Ayers. life to be able to do so. These, Mr. President, far from entrapment, these are opportunities that we are creating for greater, Order. greater financial time for sustainability the for Australian families. Senator Antich. President, Mr. President, my question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, what is the Morrison government doing to secure Australia's recovery by skilling Australians for jobs today and into the future? through its 2021-22 budget. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Antic uh, for his question. And Mr President, uh, the budget that was handed down last night sets out the next stage of the Morrison government's economic plan to get Australia and Australians through COVID-19. One of the measures that we are investing in is in terms of businesses being able to take on further apprentices and trainees. We brought down a budget that backs people who want to become an apprentice and trainee, but also provides that mechanism for a business to actually take them on. On this side of the chamber, on the government side, we know the governments themselves don't create jobs. We put in place policy frameworks. And the policy framework that the Morrison government puts in place enables businesses out there to prosper, grow, and in this case, create opportunities for apprenticeships and a traineeships for more Australians. And what we saw in last night's budget was the government committed to extending the Boosting Apprenticeships Commencement Wage Subsidy with an additional $1.5 billion. And colleagues, we are now extending out this incredibly successful program to the 31st of March 2022. Mr President, under this program, what we have seen to date is 140,000 Australians have been able to enter an apprenticeship or traineeship. 140,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships have been created since this program has been created. The further funding, the further funding that we actually announced last night in the budget, an additional $1.5 billion. What we will now see is this program will now deliver an additional approximately 170,000 apprentices. And that is because we understand, the Morrison government understands, that you need to put in place that pipeline of skilled workers and provide businesses and Australians with the opportunity to bring on and to undertake Order. apprenticeships. Senator, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how is the government supporting women in getting apprenticeships in non-traditional trades? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government is focused on seeing more women go into apprenticeships and trades. Why? Because we know that once you've actually undertaken an apprenticeship or a traineeship, you have a skill for life. And what we saw with last night's budget was our continued commitment to seeing more women take up an apprenticeship in non-traditional trades with training support provided for 5,000 places. Mr President, the Morrison government is also guaranteeing, guaranteeing in-training support 
for women who take up more apprenticeships in industries such as building and construction. And certainly, as the former skills minister, I've been passionate about seeing more women pursue uh, careers in non-traditional trades, such as working with the building and construction industry, uh, and in particular with great women leaders in the building and construction industry. For example, Danita Warne, uh, who is, of course, leading the Master Builders Association. Senator Antich, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the government supporting digital businesses to take on staff and gain skills needed in a digital economy? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, what we're seeing with the digital economy is it is creating new opportunities for Australians uh, to both upskill and to reskill into roles that just say two decades ago, 20 years ago, did not actually exist or were actually in their infancy. And that is why, again, last night, what you saw uh, in the budget was an investment of around $10.7 million to trial new digital skills cadetships. This is all about helping Australians to develop high-level digital skills in fields such as cyber security, advanced manufacturing, data analytics, game design uh, and animation. And what this investment will do is provide four industry-led pilots to develop new and innovative ways to increase the number of Australians with high-level digital skills through cadetships. Again, the Morrison government, we understand the value of apprenticeships, the value of traineeships, the value for creating opportunities for women to enter into non-traditional trades, and uh, we were backing Senator those commitments Cash, in, in the, the budget. Expired. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Defence. After a two-year FOI battle with the Defence Department, the Information Commissioner granted public access to the total build and sustainment costs for the future submarines as offered by Naval Group in its tender response. The Defence Department has appealed that decision in the AAT and Naval Group have requested and been joined to the proceedings. There are now seven lawyers involved uh, fighting one Rex Patrick. We now find out that the taxpayer is paying uh, the legal cost of Naval Group, a $5.1 billion foreign company. Who approved this? Why was it approved? And are, are there any caps on the legal fees that we pay uh, for foreign entities? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick for his question. Uh, Defence tabled a response to a Senator's question from Senator Patrick in relation to this matter. The question, as Senator Patrick has indicated, relates to Defence's application to the AAT against a decision of the Information Commissioner that Defence should provide uh, certain information. Uh, Defence considers this information as being confidential information under the terms of the contract for the competitive evaluation process and, accordingly, not for public disclosure. Uh, Defence is represented in the by the Australian Government Solicitor in these proceedings and is co-joined by Naval Group in appealing against the Information Commissioner's decision. Naval Group has engaged its own legal representation. Defence and Naval Group have lodged affidavits and statements of facts, issues and contentions. Both have also lodged responses to the statement of facts, issues and contentions lodged by Senator Patrick. I understand the matter is set for hearing by the AAT uh, on the 8th and 9th of June. In regard to the payment of legal costs, Defence has, as uh, indicated in the answer to the question asked by Senator Patrick, assessed that those costs related to these proceedings may be allowable and reasonable under the terms of the strategic partnering agreement between Defence and Naval Group. Naval Group Australia, it should be noted, uh, has been established for the purpose of delivering the future submarine program, which is funded by Defence, and the matter before the AAT uh, relates to information provided by Naval Group uh, for the purposes of that future submarine program. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the question on notice advised that the payment of the legal expenses was agreed to in the strategic partnering agreement. Yet the disputed material relates to a contract that played out well before Naval Group were even selected as the partner. On what basis would the Commonwealth grant this retrospective cost indemnity, and how far back does that indemnity go? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. As I just uh, advised from the information provided to me by Defence, Defence has assessed costs relating to these proceedings may be allowable and reasonable under the terms of the strategic partnering agreement. Uh, now, the documents that are being sought 
uh, relate to the Future Submarine Program for which Naval Group Australia has been established, and which is a program funded by Defence. And Mr President, uh, on, those, uh, on those grounds, Defence have assessed that it is consistent with the terms of the SPA. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Uh, with the regards to the government paying Naval Group's legal bills, is it just a contractual arrangement between Naval Group, or is it something that all large uh, defence primes get, the uh, taxpayer paying their legal bills? How many small to medium companies get the benefit of the taxpayer paying their legal bills uh, if a dispute arises? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, I give Senator Patrick the assurance that, uh, that in equivalent circumstances under consistent contractual terms they'd be consistently applied. Senator Muriel Smith. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. When asked this morning whether references in the budget papers to vaccinating the entire population by the end of the year mean all Australians will be vaccinated by the 31st of December, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, no, there are assumptions that go into the rollout. They are not policy settings. What assumptions underpin the budget? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Well, many assumptions underpin the budget, Mr. President. Assumptions order. underpin the budget in order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Well, one of all, uh, direct relevance. <laughs> order. No. no. Order. I need to hear oh. Senator Wong's point of order. Senator Wong. Look, it is about the Prime Minister's statement today on vaccinations and the vaccination assumptions. It is the Prime Minister's own words. I would ask. Would you order. like me to read the question again, Senator Ruston? Order. order. He was asked about vaccinations, and I, 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 I would ask the, min the Minister to be directly relevant to that fact. The minister had been speaking for seven seconds, and I think I had heard more words from some interjectors than I had from the minister in that seven seconds. Um, the preamble to the question was about vaccines. The final words I have, and I am happy to be corrected, are what assumptions underpin the budget. Now, I may be, if I misheard, I am happy to be corrected. I am definitely not going to rule on direct relevance seven seconds in when the minister has referenced part of the question in his opening statement. I will listen to his answer. I've let you remind the minister of the question, Senator Birmingham, to continue. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, budget paper number one, page 36. The key assumptions that underpin the economic forecast are set out below. Outcomes could be substantially different to the forecast, depending upon the extent to which these assumptions hold. Mr. President, the first phase of Australia's vaccination program commenced in late 2021, as it says with most priority populations having been vaccinated. It is assumed that a population-wide vaccination program is likely to be in place by the end of 2021. Uh, the assumptions indeed go on, Mr President, in relation to the containment Order. of localised outbreaks of COVID-19, in relation to the management of domestic activity restrictions, in relation to the operation of state border restrictions, in relation to uh, temporary or permanent migration movements, in relation to inbound and outbound travel restrictions. Of course, there are many other assumptions, Mr. President, that do inform the budget papers, as I was saying at the outset. Mr. President, in relation to vaccine availability, it is no secret uh, that the world has faced a shock in relation to elements of the vaccine rollout, uh, particularly in relation to the AstraZeneca vaccine. And in Australia, uh, the advice that we've received from health authorities uh, to limit uh, its application uh, to those over 50. That has obviously had a change in relation to the rollout schedule and expectations. Nonetheless, Mr. President, uh, our government has procured around 170 million doses of vaccines that can give Australians confidence that throughout the course of this year, we will receive the vaccine doses uh, that will enable Australians to have the choice to be vaccinated, and we will urge all Australians to follow the health advice and to be vaccinated Order. in accordance with that advice. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. When Mr Morrison said, and I quote, no, there are assumptions that go into the rollout, they are not policy settings, what are the policy settings related to the vaccine rollout? Senator Birmingham. No, 
Mr. President, the policy settings that relate to the vaccine rollout uh, are the billions of dollars that our government is investing in procuring Order. those vaccines, in the contractual arrangements that we have pursued with the states and territories, with primary health networks of GPs across the country that are providing uh, more than 5,000 potential points of vaccination across the country now, that have achieved uh, more than 2.7 million do vaccine doses being administered to date, uh, and that will see continued distribution of vaccines across Australia throughout this year and no doubt into next year as well. We can see around Order. the world uh, that other countries are now taking the steps of assessing vaccine applicability to children. Those are considerations that obviously our health experts and regulators will give, which will no doubt if they decide to approve that and necessitate further changes to the vaccine program over time to come, in Order. addition to Senator potential Birmingham. for Senator further booster time doses. Time for the answers expired. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Minister, why are the vaccine rollout assumptions that underpin the budget not consistent with the policy settings related to the vaccine rollout? Senator Birmingham. No, Mr. Mr. President, I reject, I reject that question. That's, that's not, that is not. That is not Order. the case. That is not the case. Senator Wong. That is not the case. Senator and I won't Keneally. accept the burbling of the Prime Minister from those opposite either, Mr. Order. President. Mr. President, and, and what is in the budget under the assumptions are indeed just that assumptions. Those assumptions, though, are consistent with the government policy settings, which have entered into contracts around the world to secure to secure around 170 million doses of vaccines for Australia, to ensure that we have that supply, that we have the distribution network, that can enable, as indeed the budget assumptions say, that can enable a population-wide vaccine program to be in place by the end of 2021. Now, Mr President, they are the assumptions on which the budget is built policies enable that possibility to be delivered Order. and our Senator focus Birmingham, is on delivering time it. For the answer has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, can the minister please explain how the biosecurity package contained in this year's budget bolster our commitment to protect Australian agricultural industries and regional communities? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, yeah. Drought and Emergency yeah. Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Davey for her question about this really, really important issue that confronts Australia's farming sector. Um, the government is investing $850 million in this budget as a commitment towards supporting our agricultural sector to get to $100 billion worth of farm gate value. Uh, and as part of the critical um, pillar in this is obviously supporting biosecurity, and 400, over $400 million will be invested in biosecurity measures to make sure that we keep Australia's agricultural sector safe from the incursion of foreign pests and diseases. Because we know that agriculture continues to be one of the economic powerhouses of this country. And despite things like uh, the impacts of drought and floods and bushfires and the COVID pandemic, we still as a country rely immensely on our agricultural sector. So keeping Australia free from pests and diseases is one of the most important things that we can do to make sure that we support Australian pro uh, agricultural producers, because we know that biosecurity matters to them. It matters to them because the hard work they've done to gain market access could be compromised yep. by pests and diseases. Yep. They know that they get a premium price for their products overseas because of our clean, green reputation. Um, and we know that even the small outbreaks that have happened in Australia can have devastating impacts, including more recently the over $2 billion that has cost us to deal with, uh, with African swine flu. Um, we know that, for instance, if foot and mouth disease ever came into our country, we're looking at a $50 billion cost to our agricultural sector over the, the, preceding, uh, the succeeding 10 years. So we are absolutely stepping up our resolve, our commitment, our funding to make yeah, sure yeah. that we combat where we can the incursion of pests and diseases into our country because we stand hand uh, side by side with our agricultural yeah, yeah. producers. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. 
Thank you. And can the minister further outline any other investments in biosecurity and export services and their ongoing role in reducing threats to our livestock, crops and our environment? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. We're investing in lots of things, but we believe that technological solutions, such as the groundbreaking trials to screen biosecurity offshore, um, the implementation of uh, you know development of modern innovative detection systems like our 3D X-ray machines and algorithms, that are much much more likely to be able to target where. Um, risks are likely to be higher. Um, and our announcement confirms our long-standing commitment that we will continue to invest record amounts of money to keep Australian agricultural producers doing what they do best, and that's producing fantastic, clean, green Australian produce. Um, we know that on average every year there are 2.5 million shipping containers arrive in Australia. 19,000 commercial vessels arrive and 60 million mail items. Supply chains are becoming more complex and biosecurity risks are challenging and spreading uh, regionally and globally. That's why we are making the investment in, that delivers for import and export services to ensure the movement of goods yeah. is safe. Order. Yeah. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And finally, can the minister please update the Senate on how these investments <clears throat> will assist Australian agriculture and support Australians as we continue to secure Australia's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr President. Well, our strong biosecurity system enables our agricultural sector, uh, and, but it protects our way of life in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Australia's biosecurity system protects the $53 billion in agriculture's fishery and forestry exports and 1.6 million Australian jobs uh, across the entire um, supply chain. So the suite of biosecurity measures that are contained in this budget are just one of the initiatives that we have putting in place to boost the economic recovery and complement the reforms that we are implementing across our entire biosecurity system to make it the most modern, efficient and effective system and making sure we keep Australia and Australians safe. Recently, modelling from the University of Melbourne said that the net present value of what we are seeking to protect by our biosecurity systems is $314 billion over the coming years. And that means that this is about a $30 return on investment for every dollar that we invest in biosecurity. It makes absolute common sense. Order. Senator Thank you, Mr. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. This morning, this minister said, and I quote, I expect some Australians will still be getting vaccinated next year. On what date will Australians be fully vaccinated and how many doses per week need to be achieved to meet this target? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I didn't make any statements with respect to vaccination this morning, so it's uh, somewhat difficult for me to respond to something that, as that the opposition are alleging order. that I have said, Mr. Order. President. Sorry, I've got but Senator, Senator, Senator Colbeck. I've, I've got to take the point of order from Senator Keneally. Order. Uh, order. I've got Sorry. to take. Listen to the point okay. of order, Senator Keneally. My apologies, and that is my fault. I take responsibility here, Mr. President. My question was actually to Minister Birmingham. There was a typo on my paper. I apologise. Um, well, yeah. I'm, I apologise. I'm, I'm afraid that is. Um, I'm afraid that is not something I can resolve. Um, I'm afraid that is not something I can resolve. It was a question to. Um, uh, 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 Senator Keneally, um, appreciate you accepting the error was on your part, but the question was directed to the minister representing the minister for health. So I, I, I must allow him to continue. He's commenced his answer. Um, um, Senator Colbeck, have you concluded your answer? No, Mr. President, I, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to assist the House uh, with um, some, some information with respect to the uh, vaccination rollout, Mr. President. Uh, and as of um, close of business yesterday, Mr. President, uh, we have uh, a number of national number of vaccinations of over 2.8 million, Mr. President. Uh, 76,379 in the previous. Uh, 24 hours, Mr. President. In, um, in aged care, Mr. President, we've done 215,000 doses, and that's 
126,923 first doses, Mr. President, and 89,040 second doses, uh, and 55,700 doses supporting order, staff Senator, and residents. Order. <coughs> Senator Keneally, on a Thank point of you. order. Thank uh, you. This point of order is relevant. I, I'm, the senator doesn't have to explain Minister Birmingham's comments, but he could answer the question, which was, on what date will Australians be fully vaccinated, and how many doses per week need to be administered okay, allowed, to achieve I've, this Keneally, target? Senator Keneally, I've allowed you order. Order. Um, Senator Keneally, um, there was a, a, a quotation that you uh, uh, accept erroneously put to the minister in your question. Um, I, I can't rule in this circumstance that talking very specifically about vaccination numbers is not directly relevant, um, but I, this is, a, a, I think, a unique circumstance in addressing direct relevance in a question. Um, the minister is constraining himself to specific numbers. I, I, I believe that to be directly relevant given the circumstances. Senator Colbeck. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, the government will continue to grow and develop the vaccination rollout uh, in accordance with the, the growth in supply, which we all accept has been one of the uh, th things we've had to manage through the pandemic. We did not expect, Mr. President, that 3.1 million doses of vaccine wouldn't be available. And as more vaccine becomes available, Mr. President, we'll make more vaccines available through the nearly 5,000 outlets that we have available for Australians to achieve their vaccination. And of course, Mr. President, it is a voluntary process. It is not compulsory for Australians to be vaccinated. We are Order. offering vaccinations progressively to all Australians uh, based on the approvals of the TGA. And Mr. President, at this point in time, we actually don't have globally a vaccine that's approved for use, and what, particularly in Australia, we don't have a vaccine that's approved for the use in, um, in younger Australians, people under the age of 18, Mr. President. So, so, Mr. President, the, the Labor Party clearly don't understand the process of the development of Order, the vaccine Senator rollout. Colbeck, time they for continue the to try has and undermine. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. On what date will Australians be fully vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, as I have said, and if the Labor Party had been listening to the last question that I just answered, I have said that Order. vaccination, Mr. President, Order. is a voluntary process. We don't have yet in this country a vaccine approved for people under the age of 18, Mr. President. So, Order. Mr. President, Senator because Watt. the TGA has not approved one Senator yet, Watt. Mr. President. So if the Labor Party don't understand Senator those Watt. simple fundamentals about the vaccine process, uh, about the safe application of the vaccine process uh, that we are rolling out, Mr. President, I actually feel quite sorry for them, Mr. President. We will continue to build the vaccine uh, rollout with availability, with the uh, availability of new vaccines uh, that will look after not only. Uh, Australians at a senior level, those that are over 50 that are available, uh, that have ac access Order, to the vaccine Senator now. And Colbeck, those in the Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. The Morrison government has broken promise after promise to administer 4 million vaccinations by the end of March, to vaccinate all of 1A by the end of Easter, to vaccinate 6 million Australians by the 10th of May. On what date will all Australians who want to be vaccinated receive their vaccine. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The Labor Party seem to live in this parallel universe where they completely forget, Mr. President, where they completely forget that we did not receive 3.1 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine that we were expecting. They, they neglect to tell the Australian people that, based on health advice, we had to reset the vaccine rollout to uh, provide uh, AstraZeneca vaccine Order. only to people 50 and over, based on health advice, Mr. President. They live in this parallel universe where they continue to undermine the public confidence in the vaccine rollout when we want to maintain the vaccine, the, the confidence in the vaccine rollout, because it is important that Australians front up, come and get a vaccination as it becomes available to them in the category that's open to them, Mr. President. We will continue to responsibly build and grow the vaccine rollout with vaccine availability and ensure that Australians have access to safe and high-quality vaccines. Senator O'Sullivan. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the Morrison McCormack government's record $110 billion infrastructure rollout announced in this 2021-22 budget and how it will secure Australia's recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President, and indeed I can. And thank you very much to Senator O'Sullivan for the question and for his passionate support for the development of infrastructure right across our great state of Western Australia and indeed nationally. Despite what those opposites say, the Morrison McCormack government is continuing to secure Australia's recovery with a record investment in infrastructure as part of the 21-22 budget. This is continuing to support and secure jobs. It is driving growth and helping rebuild Australia's economy from COVID-19, which is still far from over. So not only does this $110 billion 10-year infrastructure pipeline form part of our economic recovery plan, it is helping secure Australia's world-leading economic recovery. This record infrastructure is delivering, is actually delivering nation-building infrastructure projects water security to inland Australia. It's meeting our water. national freight challenge and it's also getting Australians home sooner and safer. Some examples. Uh, this builds on the significant projects that the Morrison government has already delivered for Australia. Order. And let me remind all in this chamber of what some of those projects are that have been delivered. The Pacific Highway, the Wollongong to Ballina extension, $3.7 billion. The Ballarat Wright Lale upgrade in Victoria, half a billion dollars. The North South Corridor, Darlington upgrade in South Australia, over $200 million. The Bruce Highway, McKay Ring Road in Queensland, approximately $400 million. And a bit closer to our home, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, the Great Northern Highway, the Muche to Woburn upgrade in Western Australia, $275 million. This $110 billion rollout, I'll say that again, $110 billion rollout includes an additional, an additional $15.2 billion in new commitments. So far from a cut, Order. it is Senator additional Reynolds. spending. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate of the flow and effects of jobs and the result of this $110 billion infrastructure investment? Senator Reynolds. President, and indeed I can, and very proudly so. This government has a very proud record of delivering major infrastructure projects right across our nation. In fact, more than 220 projects, 220 projects are currently under construction right around our great nation. And these projects are supporting over 100,000 Australian jobs. The $15.2 billion in new commitments to infrastructure projects will support an additional, an additional 30,000 jobs across Australia, which has never been more important. So this budget is funding projects including $2 billion for the Great Western Highway upgrade, Katoomba to Lithgow in New South Wales, $2 billion to deliver the, new the Melbourne Intermodal Terminal. $400 million for the Bruce Highway, additional funding in Queensland. $237.5 million for Metronet in Western Australia. $161 million for the Truro Bypass in Senator South Australia. O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the $110 billion infrastructure rollout is driving uh, economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And indeed, I can. I still had such a long list of projects that this government is delivering. I didn't quite get through them all. This infrastructure rollout means, above all else, it means local jobs in local communities right across Australia. For example, the new intermodal freight terminal in Melbourne will support both the Victorian and also, importantly, our national freight networks, creating up to 1,350 jobs during peak construction and a further 550 jobs during peak operation. The additional $1 billion for the highly successful $2.5 billion local roads and community infrastructure program is also successfully delivering local projects that matter to local communities right across our nation. And that, again, means local jobs, not just direct construction jobs, but jobs that flow right through local communities. 
This funding is also supporting around 3,500 jobs, taking the total jobs supported by this program to 9,000. This Order. is what Senator good Reynolds, government time for looks the answer like. Has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. See you in half an hour. To take note of answers, Senator Urquhart. President, I rise to take note of the response by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Wong regarding the wage stagnation the government that he is part of has presided over to, for eight long years. Wage stagnation, which the, this budget predicts will continue. In fact, the, bu in, uh, the budget that the Treasurer, Mr Frydenbrew, brought down last night rep represents a real wages cut and is an admission of failure by this government, this government. Even after spending $100 billion and racking up a $1 trillion in debt, the wages of Australian working people will still go backwards in this government's budget, which is a pretty extraordinary admission of failure. And, after, and everything Australian workers have been through together, and particularly after the last year of struggle, the thanks they get from the Morrison government is a cut in real wages. It's a stunning outcome from the budget and not an outcome which this minister should be proud of in any shape or form. And yet he responded to questions today with the smugness and spin that we've become accustomed to from this government which is quite happy to make all sorts of announcements and walk away from the consequences for ordinary Australians. That's what this government does. It's announcement, 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 re-announcement, re-announcement, re-announcement. But they walk away from the consequences of what their actions are in budgets that affect the ordinary Australians. We've seen the same shirking of responsibility with the Morrison government the response in the horrific bushfires. We've seen it with the floods. We've seen it with recovery from natural disasters. We've seen it with the quarantine rollout, the quarantine, the vaccination. We've seen it in aged care, and we've seen it with that litany of failure, the vaccine rollout, that they continue to become a failure to act in the best interests of working Australians, a failure to take any responsibility and a failure to act. Labor has said all along that part of the task at hand is getting unemployment down, but also in addressing underemployment. People can't find the hours to work that they need to support their loved ones, and we know that, and this minister knows, until that's addressed, then we won't get wages growth. And the minister knows very well there are other issues which are preventing people from getting good, secure, well-paid jobs. The industrial relations system, the childcare system, skills and training, concentrated disadvantage, a whole range of issues which haven't just been ignored over the last eight long years of this government, but actively made worse. Having racked up all of that debt and spent all of that money, Minister Birmingham and his government is missing a massive opportunity to set the economy up for the future, where working people actually get a slice of the action when it comes to this economic recovery, because it's not simply a recovery of Australian workers are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Deloitte Access Economics has forecast that workers could be waiting for up to five years for wages growth to return to 2 per cent. Five years. Two million Australians are either without a job or don't have enough hours and wages are stagnant. What is very, very clear is that this government is using the pandemic to continue to lock in low wages and insecure work, and it has every intention, every intention of continuing that mission. What we can look forward to under this government is a patchy recovery that's defined by even weaker wages growth, followed record wa low, low wages growth under the Liberals prior to the pandemic. What we all know is that wages growth has been too slow for too long. And with the current condition of our economy and the policies to repress wages presided over by this government, unemployment may need to go very low before wages growth hits acceptable levels and starts to feed through into inflation. 
This government has presided over a repression of wages in this country over eight long years. Huge numbers of jobs casualised and pushed into labour hire, relentless attacks on unions, offshoring jobs, constantly arguing for tiny or no increases in the minimum wage, a wages policy to crush the wages of its own employees that just beggars belief. What we need is a real vision, not this pathetic rabble that responds to newspaper headlines and no coherent you, plan Senator for the Urquhart. country. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. You know, I, I, I just look at you guys over there, and clearly you weren't paying attention in Year 7 economics. I mean, there's a book at the moment that perhaps you should have a look at. Economics for Today. It's a Year 7 textbook. And it might help you understand there's a little principle in economics called supply and demand. So when you work on reducing unemployment and workers become harder to come by, it actually means employers will pay them more. Now, do we need to have a little talk about inflation as well? Because when last year we were in the midst of a global pandemic and businesses were closing down and shutting their doors and all these states were locking up their borders, that made it harder for people to maintain their jobs. So what the Morrison government did was ensure that people could still put their kids in childcare by making it free. So when we look at inflation figures and all of a sudden lots of costs that families normally endure no longer have a cost, that means there's a thing called lower inflation. So when we get lower inflation and we look at what that means to wages in the year where we get higher inflation, that means it kind of looks like real wages are going down, but in effect they're not. It's just being covered by the return to what we would call a more normal rate of inflation around three, three and a half per cent, rather than zero, as was experienced during the 2020 pandemic, pretty much across the globe. But, you know, let's talk back a little bit more about job creation, because I know, you know, you guys get your wages primarily from the unions and they're probably on a scale, so they go up indexed every year, you know, more on confidence rather than capability, but let's never let that get in the way of a promotion within the union movement. But for those of us that live in the real world, the 80 per cent of people who are employed by small and medium-sized businesses, their wages are determined by how successful their business is and the business that they work in, how tough it is for their employers to get staff because if it's harder to get a staff member, you normally need to offer more money or an inducement to get them to come and work in your business. Again, let's come back for all of those that didn't pay attention, supply and demand. When the demand for workers is greater and the supply is shorter, wages will go up. So last night in the budget, we saw what the Morrison government is doing to ensure that the Australian economy keeps powering on. We are best place in the world with our recovery. The fact that we have a health situation, that the virus has been suppressed, not the McGowan strategy of you know, completely extinguishing it, but the suppression strategy that was actually what we undertook at the beginning, that that's been successful. And the fact that businesses are thriving and that we're starting to see life in a lot of ways go back to pre-COVID conditions, we want to make sure that that economic growth continues. We want to make sure that businesses are able to continue to expand and employ more people. So how are we going to do that? We're going to ensure that things like the instant asset write-off continue into the future so that we continue to see the capital markets, so that we see people investing in machinery for their businesses or the tradie can buy the new ute. We're making childcare more targeted when we talk to low and middle income families. So we're going to make it easier and more affordable for people to take on additional days of work. So it's the Morrison government that's focused on seeing businesses grow. It's the Morrison government that's committed to ensuring Australia's economy comes back. 
and it is the Morrison government that is putting Australia and its workers first. Now, over 99 per cent of these businesses with over, that employ over 11 million workers, when they write off their eligible asset, we have also seen that those businesses that traditionally suffer during times of downturn have in fact thrived. So if you go out to W. J. Matthews in Moree, there's been a fair few headers and tractors bought that would have normally not happened. That's a significant number of jobs for a country town. Guess what? It's pretty tough to get a mechanic out there. Supply and demand, guys. It's how you keep the wages growing. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. And uh, you know, it's always good to hear from my, my good friend on the other side of the aisle, Senator Hughes, uh, talking about numbers and economics, because as if the Liberal Party are the only ones that can understand such concepts. Uh, but what they failed to understand, I guess the, the, the question, the very question that Senator Wong had asked today to Senator Birmingham, who is meant to be the Minister for Finance, on page 37, there were very simple questions. It's very simple questions with respect to um, cuts to real wages. Because when you do look at the numbers and you do look at the figures in the budget paper, budget paper number one, Deputy President, on page 37, it is very clear that there is a cut, a cut from, uh, from 1.8 down to 1.25. Now, that's simple accounting. I don't know what you want to call it, Senator Hughes, but that is very simple maths when it comes to very clear cuts to real wages for Australian workers by this federal government, the Morrison Liberal National Government. So let's not forget that. Black and white, page 37. And yet they couldn't answer that simple question, three simple questions, in fact. The first one that Senator Wong had put to Senator, to Senator Birmingham. And it took a while for the government to finally, finally acknowledge, yes, $1 trillion, $1 trillion of debt. Who would have thought? I remember going to uni studying economics and never in my wildest dreams would I ever be in this place imagining that we would be confronted with $1 trillion of debt and growing. I did not miss the pandemic, Minister, but it is just amazing when those opposite try to lecture us on this side that they somehow are better economic managers than us. But quite frankly, the record speaks for itself. So once again, what we've had is, much, is more spin than substance. And we know that this budget has been handed down last night is by no means a budget whose purpose is to support working people. Nor is it a budget that it is what it takes to usher forward the recovery of the Australian economy from the pandemic. And this should hardly be surprising. After eight long years under the Liberal National Government, we've all become rather used to budgets like these. One only has to look at the flop of last year's budget, job maker scheme. You know, the headline be 450,000 new jobs. Well, where are they, Minister? Where are they? Come on, 450,000 jobs. Where are they? But yet the budget is forecasting that we maintain migration levels at 160,000. So this government's priority is bringing about more foreign workers into this country rather than supporting local Australians finding work. You know, unemployment is around that 5 to 6 per cent, and that will fluctuate. It will. It will. And yet this government has no incentives in encouraging those people to find work. You know, there are lots of businesses around the country right now who are screaming murder. They need workers. They need help. Yeah, but what are the incentives of getting those people into a job? But it feels like this budget is all about trying to make sure that we can get migrants into this country. Cooks, you know, chefs, we've had people about nursing. Are we really not in a position to train our young people into these jobs? Well, I, don't you worry, Minister. I'll be going through this and I'll be making my contributions in this place and making my, my views well known about where this government's lack of history or hi of um, supporting traineeships, because what we've seen is a cut, not an increase of support. You've taken out $400 million out of universities. Come on, at a time, at a time, at a time where we need to be upskilling people, upskilling people. Come on, Minister. And 12 uh, months, 12 months. 
Yeah. Um, 12 months on, we know the facts. 12 months on, we know that the job maker scheme, originally funded for $4 billion, is actually only delivered $100 million of that amount, and only 2.5 per cent of what was spruced has actually made it out the door. Now, I don't have much time left, but I did also want to touch on the fact that household debt in Australia is at scary levels. Scary levels. Like We are looking at household debt uh, at around 185 per cent when you look at the ratios. I mean, how on earth can people pay off their debt when this government keeps cutting wages of Australian workers? You are, and shame on the government. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I think the Labor Party have jumped ahead just a couple of steps because when we talk about wage growth in Australia, that obviously implies that someone has a job. And thanks to the economic stewardship of the Morrison government through the most calamitous economic event since the Great Depression to beset this nation, more Australians are back in work. In fact, 75,000 more Australians are in work than they were in March 2020. So I think to set the record straight today, it's worth stepping back and cutting through the spin that we hear from those opposite and going back to where this nation was in March last year. And at that time, Treasury uh, feared unemployment would reach 15 per cent and that the economy would contract by an incredible 20 per cent. That would have taken two million Australians out of work, Senator Coney, not in terms of a wage cut, but throwing them completely out of employment entirely. In fact, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, we saw almost a million Australians lose their job or be stood down with no hours to work. How far we have come. Now, 13.1 uh, million Australians, or 75,000 more than at the start of the pandemic, are in work. That represents an unemployment rate of 5.6 per cent, which happens to be lower than that bequeathed to us by the Labor Party. Let's not forget their big taxing, big spending agenda had more Australians on the unemployment queues than the economic stewardship of the Morrison government. So what does that actually deliver for Australians? Well, aside from those who uh, enjoy the, the, uh, the benefits of work, the, the connectivity to their communities, the ability to contribute to their families, that 5.6 per cent unemployment rate and a trajectory towards uh, full employment increases the pressure in the labour market that will naturally drive wages growth in this country. So once we see uh, the economy continuing to recover from this global pandemic, and once we see even more Australians in work, which is the fervent hope of everyone over here on the government benches, we will see higher levels of wage growth, higher levels of prosperity, and ultimately it is those healthy and wealthy societies like ours that concentrate on delivering services for the most vulnerable in our communities. At the end of the day, it is the sorts of economic comeback that we see here in Australia today that pays for the increases in NDIS funding, that pays uh, for the increased funding to record levels for our aged care sector. That is the achievement of a strong economy. The Prime Minister the Treasurer and those in the Morrison government don't talk about a strong economy for the sake of it. We're not obsessing over numbers on uh, you know, page 37 of budget paper number one trying to find something to quibble over. Instead, we're focused on the lived reality out there in the Australian community and improving it for future generations of Australians. That's the achievement that we see here today. Because whilst the economies of the UK, France and Italy contracted by 8 per cent last year, and Japan and Canada contracted by 5 per cent. Australia's economic contraction was limited to just 2.5 per cent, and we are returning to growth in the 21-22 year, financial year. Incredibly, we're talking about GDP growth of 4.25 per cent in the financial year ahead. That is the benefit of the Morrison government's economic stewardship, and that is what will deliver wage growth in Australia going forward. The outcome was driven uh, that we see today uh, by stronger growth in private sector wages, which increased 0.7 per cent to be 1.4 per cent higher than they were a year ago. So the wage price index in Australia 
has actually increased to be 1.4 per cent higher than it was a year ago. But the Morrison government isn't done yet. No, we're not resting on our laurels after delivering the strongest quarterly outcome in private sector wage growth since March 2014, and in fact the second best quarterly result under this government. We will continue to manage the economy, to promote full employment, to keep Australians in work and to deliver for those uh, most vulnerable Australians who rely on a strong economy to provide the safety net that they depend on. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And we asked a very simple question of Senator Birmingham today, a question that Australians want an answer to. How long will they have to wait for a pay rise under this government? How long? And they are still waiting. They are waiting for an answer to this critical question, and they are waiting for some evidence that this government even cares, even cares about their wages. Uh, but we can find some evidence for the Australian people uh, to help answer this critical question that we asked on their behalf on their behalf today in the pathetic record of this government already on wages the pathetic record eight long years of record low wage growth under this government eight long years of low wages as a deliberate design feature a deliberate design feature of their economic plan and now, today, Australians are expected to believe that Australia is coming back, as the Treasurer said last night, coming back while their wages are falling behind, coming back while their wages are, and I repeat, falling behind. There is no recovery from this pandemic that leaves workers behind. There is no recovery that lets Australians' wages go backwards. There is no recovery without good, secure jobs for Australian workers. And this government needed to deliver that plan this week. They needed to deliver and they failed. They failed. Australians are still waiting for an answer to their question, when will we have good, secure jobs under this government? When will we have a pay rise under this government? When will we even have an answer to the question from this government? Because beneath the gloss of last night's announcements, there was a very clear message to the workers of Australia, and it was that the Liberals love low wages. You love them. You love Australians to have low wages. Low wages, according to you, a deliberate design feature of your economic plan. And under this budget, real wages for Australians go backwards. Under this budget, they go backwards. And it is not good enough. It is not good enough for workers who've been waiting years for a pay rise, but instead have seen wage growth slow to record lows under this government. It is not good enough for the essential workers who carried the nation through this pandemic. And the thanks that they get for that from Scott Morrison, uh, from the Treasurer, is a cut to their real wages. A cut to their real wages. A cut to their real wages. It is not good enough for the low paid workers of this country and the growing number of people in insecure jobs who find it harder and harder to make ends meet. And Labor knows, and Australians know, that there is no recovery when workers are left behind. We know that the Liberals' happy place, though, is attacking wages. They have been doing it for years. They were coming after workers' wages earlier this year with their nasty IR bill, and the budget it speaks for itself on wages. You only have to get to page nine, page nine to see that wages for working people will fall even further behind, not even keeping up with inflation. And after all of this, after announcing spending of $100 billion and racking up a trillion dollars in debt, Australians will not see a pay rise under this government. They will not see a pay rise under this government. So let's be clear what this means. 
Real wages are continuing to fall, and the government will not be getting any more money into the pockets of working Australians. They have no plans to get wages moving. What an admission of failure. And how many times did the Prime Minister try to go out and thank and shake the hands of essential workers during the pandemic? The supermarket workers, the cleaners, the early childhood educators, the delivery drivers, those low-wage workers who prove themselves to be essential day in, day out. Who does the Prime Minister think will suffer the most from wages falling behind even further? Those essential workers, those people who got us through 2020 with, with their hard work. This is the thanks that this government gives them. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that motion is moved by Senator Urquhart to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move to take note of the response provided to my questions by Minister Birmingham. And in question time, I asked him repeatedly about the public subsidies to encourage the burning of fossil fuels that are contained in this budget, and uh, he uh, consistently failed to acknowledge that point. He dissembled, he changed the subject, he answered questions that weren't asked. But what he did not ever mention was the $51 billion of direct subsidies, public funds, in this budget allocated to encourage the burning of fossil fuels. <clears throat> now, the state, the absolutely bleedingly obvious, our climate is breaking down around us. It's going to be catastrophic for billions of people. <coughs> we have mere years to prevent the worst effects of the climate catastrophe, and every single day counts in our response. And what do we see in the government's response yesterday? <coughs> Handouts for fossil fuel companies, favourable treatment for billionaires, to encourage more environmental destruction and the ongoing burning of coal, oil and gas. I mean, this is a budget put together by climate criminals, and they can't say that they didn't know, because at the same time that they are giving that $50 billion plus of public subsidies to encourage the burning of fossil fuels, they are intervening to insure homes that are becoming uninsurable exactly because of climate change. <coughs> the government is offering a token amount of money for disaster responses, that is, responses to disasters like droughts, fires and floods that we know are going to be made more common and more intense as a result of climate change, driven primarily by the burning of fossil fuels and the destruction of forests and land clearing. All of those things that this government puts public subsidies into. I mean, this is a government that is both the arsonist and is trying to claim that they're, for, they're the fire brigade. And if paying billionaires directly to open up new <coughs> gas fields and uh, to implement the burning of gas wasn't bad enough, they are also refusing to make billionaires pay their fair share of tax. Australia's billionaires increased their wealth by $90 billion last year, in the middle of a global pandemic, when so many Australians were doing it so tough, and they have not, not been asked to chip in a single cent of that obscene growth in their wealth to help us fund the services that Australian people want. Better hospitals, better public education better public transport systems, better disability support, just to name a few. And meanwhile, on the government's own projections, wages will go backwards in real terms for the next two years. Let's think about that. Wages to go backwards in real terms for the next two years. Now, this is not a bug 
This is not an unintended consequence of this budget. It is a feature of this budget because the major donors to the LNP want to keep wages low so they can keep making obscene profits and they can keep dodging their responsibilities to fund the essential public services that Australians want and expect from their governments. Wages are going backwards in real terms because that is exactly what this government wants because they are major donors in this regime of institutionalised bribery that is called political donations in this country want wages to go backwards. Shrinking wages and uh, the other side of that coin, of course, is house prices spiralling out of control. Again, that's not a bug. That's not an unintended consequence. It's a feature. You're pricing a whole generation of young people out of the housing market and you are deliberately causing wages to go backwards. Shame on you all. Question is the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.